This is the Pedestrian Podcast. I don't know. That's just what pedestrian average mediocre receivers do. What's up? What's up? My man Deion Sanders, we all right, huh? We all right? Yeah, we all right. We're going to go to the Super Bowl again, being all right. The official podcast of the UK Seahawkers. Here are your hosts. Stuart Court. Le'Veon Bell wants to be paid as an offensive weapon, when, if you're the Steelers, he's come across as a bit of a weapon himself in different ways. <laughs> and Adam Nathan. Um, it's, tr- it's tricky because Hugh Jackson said nothing for me to shove him in. <laughs> we are going to follow you. Gotcha, you lead us, gotcha, okay? Let's go like I told you before, you lead us to darkness, we will follow you. Go Hawks. Seahawks in 2018 are sure trying their hardest and damnedest to make things interesting. Welcome to another episode of the Pedestrian Podcast, still the one only unofficial UK Seahawkers podcast. This week we will discuss all the wild happenings in the Queen City in Charlotte in North Carolina on Sunday evening, as well as look ahead to the, to the first of the big three, although somewhat you'd hope to be comfortable three uh, remaining NFC West Divisional games the Seahawks have on their schedule as they face the 49ers and a familiar face back at CenturyLink Field. But as always, myself, Short Court, on the Pedestrian Podcast, is joined by Adam Nathan. How are we, sir? I am good. Another glorious night watching the Mighty Spurs uh, has happened and wasn't going to record the podcast. Thought, no, nah, just go to bed, get some uh, get some kit. But I'm still buzzing from, uh, <laughs> from the win, so let's spin, because why not? Yeah, so the Seahawks went coast to almost coast as I say to Charlotte and the Bank of America Stadium which I think is what it's still called and put faced Cam Newton Christian McCaffrey and the Carolina Panthers the Panthers enter the game in a similar situation to the Seahawks trying their hardest but probably ultimate failing to keep their tabs on the the leading team in that division obviously the Saints for the Panthers and the Rams for our Seahawks and it was a pretty Exciting, pretty fun, and pretty enjoyable game for Seahawks. This is how it sounded on the Fox broadcast on Sunday evening. In trouble, escape throws. Wide open, it's Madden, and the fullback inside the five, and decked up the wall. Does he get in? No. That's a surprise. First and goal. Carson, not a surprise. Working. Touchdown, Seattle. <laughs> He's exchanging penalties. It's a first down. Fake to McCaffrey. Newton going for it. Oh! Intercepted. It's McDougal. Great play by Bradley McDougal, who tipped it to himself. By McDougal. And now Seattle with Carson. Oh, my goodness. He landed on his feet. He's still up. In this play, Carson goes full flip and stays on his feet. Man. Down and long. It's a blitz. It's picked up. Wilson going deep. He's got a man wide open. Wilson, time, firing, it is caught! And down at the one, that looked close, Lockett made the kick right there. And here it comes from Pete Carroll. The touchdown right there. That will be a touchdown. No doubt. And look at him, he, and then he breaks the ankles. Wait, it's the Allen Iverson in the <laughs> he finals. He does, he does exactly, what, and then stepped over him. He stepped over Tyron Lou. Poor Tyron. Tough. And we are tied. So Pan- Blitz picked up. Wilson going for it all. Oh, he's got it. More touchdown. The confidence it takes on fourth and three to throw the ball downfield. But this is a matchup that you knew that he liked. Evan. Graham Gano, good on all three from 50 plus this year. Snap and hold are good. The kick is up. It is. The leg. Here's Wilson, pressure up the middle. Wilson stands in, throwing deep. He's got Lockett wide open. He's got it! Tyler Lockett got behind the coverage. And the Seahawks win it here in Carolina. What a victory! The first of what are must win games pretty much from here until the end of the 2018 season. Come out with a pretty improbable. Definitely for the, at certain points of that first quarter, that the first couple of drives for the Panthers, 30 to 27 win, uh, really dampening the Panthers' player hopes, but doing nothing but boost confidence, morale, and their own playoff hopes. We say it was enjoyable, but 
it, it was somewhat a surprising score, though, all things considered, before the game and obviously then during the game and in that first half at them. Yeah, I mean, I always find it difficult to watch the games on Game Pass on the laptop. You're behind real time if you play, which I really hate. Um, you know that something's happened. You know, and I actually had David Moore's touchdown completely ruined by accidentally switching over to social media and seeing that we'd scored and it was still kind of third and three on, on my screen, which is a bit frustrating. Um, but I kind of never felt like I was fully into it from a excitement standpoint because at some point i just thought eventually these guys are going to run away from us and score yeah. um i really don't like the term bend but don't break defense I, don't, I think it's overused but it really got to a stage on sunday where you know giving up all those yards but being so good in the red zone um you know what carolina really should have scored about 45 points but we managed to limit them to 27 with a few really impressive defensive plays yeah. that is that is what bend but don't break defense means and um it was only when we got down to the last five minutes, I thought, hang about, they, they're not, they can't run away from us here. We've got half a chance. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was one of them, because obviously, I mean, there was, what was it, three red zone, the first three red zone trips, and you bought about three points, I think. Well, maybe, that might not be true, but I can't remember. Yeah, the, the, well, the certainly pass- a turnover on downs, and then a field goal with the first two. Yeah, and I'm not certain which happened on the third one. Maybe, maybe it was the third one I saw that graphic, and they were just preemptively cursing that drive. The Panthers, though, did amass all of the yards but before we get onto the defensive side of the ball for the Seahawks on Sunday um, the offense as it has been the case for so many over the last seven eight years has all come down to RW3 because he's clearly QB1 and he was at his very very best and so now I said to you and a few other guys and anyone who'd listen after the game that, it, that it, I can't remember many better performances from Russell Wilson in the situation he found himself in on the road Early kickoff, and he just—he was—he was just incredible on Sunday, wasn't he? Yeah, he was amazing. And another game that ticks by that he throws thirty times, but mysteriously uh, doesn't get mentioned when we win. When he when he throws thirty times, only only when we lose and he throws thirty times uh, is it always brought out that you know this team can't win when Wilson throws more than thirty times. So that's a, a nice little bit of uh, revisionism that's being uh, brushed under the carpet, which I always like to see. I love a bit of pettiness, if, if nothing else. So that's all good. Um, he was magnificent. He was making throws all over the place, uh, throwing to anyone that will take it. Trey Madden, for goodness sake, you know, <laughs> nearly scoring a touchdown. Um, and, you know, just little things like the throw to David Moore is majestic. And the little pump, the double move by to lock it to free him. Uh, that's just vintage Wilson. And the guy's just got absolute stones. Whatever you think of him, he, he, and there will be a game like the Rams where he might have a little bit of a brain fart at the end maybe trying to make something happen, but there's not that many guys you'd rather have in that situation than, than Wilson. No, he was 22 for 31, 339 yards, two touchdowns, and ran three times for just four yards, which somehow his longest is seven, something six, compared to that. But, I mean, the, those nine incompletions, obviously there's one really bad overthrow on Doug Baldwin yet again in the end zone, <laughs> which <laughs> this, this week ended up with Doug Baldwin getting lit up by um, the safety by the Panthers. But of the other eight, one of them was a spike to stop the clock before the Sea Bass game. When I, I literally can't think of a... I think one of them was a throw which Mike Davis probably should have got his feet in bounds. He was that much on the money on Sunday. And I, I think I think we kind of come to a collective decision that probably the Bears, his rookie year, is up there and Philly in 2014 I think was the other one you, you suggested yeah but yeah but the whole situation I mean the pressure on him because for once Chris Carson said after the game that the Panthers were starting to, were calling out their play uh, the run, they were predicting the run plays before they happened which is another matter entirely but the fact that it was put on him and the five consecutive drives to finish the game all ending in scores is all on Russell Wilson and he, yeah, he's just, he was, that, that, uh, as you said, with all the, the 30 attempt stuff, that it's, it seems to have gone under the radar somewhat over, in the, over the weekend. Obviously, Sam, the, his biggest fan on Twitter, uh, Hawk Badger, whatever his name is, he, he said it will be a travesty if he, if he doesn't win uh, a, a NFC Player of the Week or Air Player of the Week or whatever they have, what awards they have. And he's, for once, he's actually on the money because everything was everything he dumped a game was discounted that was going to happen but the fact it did was just incredible obviously the, the fourth down catch the, the throw his sidestep 
to give himself a few more seconds, few more seconds, which was basically the game winner deep to um, Tyler Lockett, the earlier throw to David Moore, the touchdown throw. He just dark, lasers it in to Tyler Lockett, who's on the uh, goal line as well. It's just yeah, it was vintage. Vintage RW3. Talking of the run game, though, Chris Carson led the way with snaps, carries, and yards. 55 yards on 16 rush attempts, one goal line touchdown. But as he, and Mike Davis would chipped in with four carries, 14, and Richard Penny four yards on four carries himself. But Chris Carson, I mean, the hot, the highlight, the viral play of the week. I saw American gymnast tweet. I saw a wrestler, a British wrestler who's in Japan. He tweeted the video of it. I mean, how the hell did he land on his feet, Adam? It was insane. I've actually always kind of thought and said to friends that the hurdle at some will be banned because it is incredibly dangerous if you get just knocked like that and it throws you off what you're doing. But I have no idea how he managed to stick the landing. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that, you know, you break your ankle because you just fall slightly in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. um, but thankfully, we, he managed to pull it off. Yeah, well, it's not the fact that he landed on his feet. It's like he landed on his feet and his knee didn't touch the ground. He just happened to get tackled like immediately, but he he was still live. He was still he, active, yeah. He was still, he was still active. He just got t- absolutely incredible. But just it, it won his day. But he still had, including that spiral uh, pirouette landing thing he did. He still had a few pretty impressive runs, and he's again clearly the lead back of the three, isn't he, Adam? Yeah, hundred percent. And in a way, you know, it's quite nice to win a game where you're not having to rely on the run game or you know. I don't think the run game has been quite as significant this year to wins as, as many have. Um, I, I think it's been complementary to great quarterback play, but it's quite nice that you have a game where you can say, do you know what, this was about the passing game, and you can have a bit more faith in the passing game to make it work. So I don't think it's that bad a thing that the run game didn't really get going this week because it's nice to, you know, ultimately all of the good teams are multifaceted, and if that's what we want to be, it's nice to know that we can do it both ways, which is great. Yeah, and obviously the main recipients of the passes from Russell Wilson on Sunday were, in particular, the big plays come from David Moore, with obviously the fourth, fourth and three. Just it was, as I, as I said on things on Twitter or maybe on WhatsApp, it, it was like Randy watching Randy Moss that play, how he just used his body, used his he initiated contact in the DB and just held on to it just quite long, so it wasn't a pass interference against him, and just perfectly left his hands down by his side until the very last moment to not to not give the DB, um, an opportunity to get his hands and break the ball. It was just absolute perfection, that play. He finished the game with four catches on five targets, 103 yards and that score. And then, obviously, the other guy, Tyler Lockett, 107 yards on five catches and a score for himself. Tyler Lockett, as we said, is now Pat is now got his career best, eight touchdowns in the season, and he's now just three, three yards and eight catches away from... Uh, for, getting career highs in those two categories again but in a game which it sounds like Doug Baldwin 100% again it's, it's good that two guys these those two guys again stepped up in his in his place didn't they yeah I mean you you have to be able to sling it all over the field otherwise you become way too easy to stop so you had to hope Lockett was going to end up being like this otherwise you wouldn't have paid him 10 million dollars a year or so um and I guess David Moore has become what you hope Brandon Marshall would be. So they, they probably went into the season thinking that there was enough there. And I think it was our mate Will said, uh, or it may have been you that said that, you know, David Moore is kind of showing why Dwight Freeney, Dwight Freeney was cut last year to keep David Moore on the on the roster because he um, he looks an incredible asset and a guy that would probably be twins worse off with yeah. um, if we didn't have him. So it's great to see him. You hope that as the season goes on, um, Wilson, who's a, a real kind of relationships guy, and he does throw it. You know, he does like throwing to his his guys. Um, you have to hope that as they have more reps, that, that that can improve and the relationships grow stronger and stronger. Yeah, and people and Malik Turner come up from the practice squad and had his first catch in his NFL career. Nick Vanet made a some pretty important a couple on third down as well. Grabs as his eight Dixon's pretty quiet in his return to Carolina, but I think he had a couple of grabs as well. So all everyone. Did their bit, and he, he, including number 89, who was quite clearly, it sounds like, hobbled on Sunday. He did his usual, and as I said, he should have had a touchdown if Russell Wilson gets that ball away a heartbeat sooner and a little bit lower. Some yeah, uh, Vinette, sorry, Vinette's been really impressive the last month. Nick Vinette, I don't know what it is. He's, he 
I know you compare him to Cooper Alfred, but he he he, he looks like a slightly lesser. Uh, Zach Miller was just did everything to a pretty decent, pretty decent to good level. Nick Minnette has done that over the last, well, this season, really, especially since Will Disley got injured in Arizona. Do you reckon he could handle, like, eight targets a game? I'd imagine so, but I don't think, I mean, we kind of saw all the hand-wringing over Jimmy Graham the last few years. I don't think that's going to be a massive part of the offense in the past. They're never going to be target number one on plays. I I don't think anything we've seen in the last few years has has shown that. We we didn't do it, we had a a cheat code at tight end. I mean, it kind of second guess why they give all that money to Ed Dixon over such a long period of time, if that's the case. But I, yeah, I, I, I think he'd be able to take it if it happened to say a Baldwin or uh, a David Moore. So he, he could be like that third wide receiver to so use Dixon different ways if that happens. But yeah, I, I think he could. I think he's took his opportunity. I think he kind of Disley kind of maybe lit a fire under him. It's just kind of what players like that kind of need because he kind of. Knew his place with when Luke Wilson and Jimmy Graham were in in town, and he, he he now knows his place, and now have you'd hope has the confidence he can do it, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, like we don't run a lot of screens for whatever yeah. reason, but you kind of feel like off play action, you could dump it off to the net, have a couple of blockers in front. He'd probably pick you up fifteen yeah. twenty yards. Like he's yeah. he's athletic. He's got. I know we we briefly kind of <laughs> liken him to someone like George Kittle, but from a physicality <laughs> point of view, he's got that he's got that type of body. Yeah. Yeah, it, it 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 will be interesting, but I think also he's now building up the trust with Wilson, with the coaches, with Pete Carroll, that like he would be able to do that. So obviously we do kind of hope at the same time that he isn't asked to do that because that would mean other things have gone wrong elsewhere, wouldn't it? Yeah, although again, all all of these good teams managed to find a way to get their That's tight true. end involved. So yeah. you know, as as the other option, um, sure. especially as. You know, I, I imagine whenever teams see us bring in a heavy set, you know, go to three tight end, one one back personnel, they're thinking run. You know, if you can run a play action there um, and dump it off to him, you know, you could be in line for a really big play off that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, it, it will be interesting, but I, I do think trust is there, confidence is there in himself and from the quarterback throwing the ball as well. So it, he's definitely earned the right to get that trust. It's just the case if the situation ever allows some offensive stats come out of the it's game. a bit of nick for net chat 10 to 12 yeah. on, a, on a wednesday night who would have thought yeah yeah, yeah. uh so some offensive stats after that game russell wilson's passer rating over the past seven games is frankly ridiculous 132.5 125.4 158.3 89.2 123.2 110.3 and 128.3 it's been a lot of chat on the ringer and the guys over at the athletic about how worthless passer rating QBR QB rating is in the 2018 version of the NFL. But those numbers so consistently and so high, so consistently high is that to show what kind of level Wilson is playing at, as we said earlier, Adam. Yeah, hundred percent. I think one of the big things that I don't like about passer rating, which I think is valid is that it doesn't account for any yards after the catch, which I think like Mariota had a 61 yard touchdown, yeah. which had 59 yards after yeah, the yeah. catch, which does seem a bit ridiculous. But I think with all of these statistics, a lot of them don't tell the whole story, but it's a pretty good way to build up an initial case for your story. So I don't know how you can look at any stat and say, uh, you know, if you looked at the stats, you'd say, Oh, it seems like Wilson's playing well. And then I think if you then watch the tape, that would kind of be back, back up what the stats have been saying and vice versa. Yeah, and also after after Sunday, Russell Wilson's QB rating for his career went back above 100, which means only him and Aaron Rodgers have a career QBR of over 100. He also passed Dave Craig for the most regular season franchise win with his 71st win on Sunday, which is pretty impressive. And if you look at the QB stats all time for the Seahawks and look at the, how many games it's, it took, Messrs. Craig, Hasselbeck and Zorn to get the numbers they amassed and compiled. Russell Wilson's going to blow those out of the water by the time he is done on the defensive. I think, I think also, if I'm not mistaken, he is one win away from having the most quarterback wins inside seven after his first seven seasons. And he already holds the record for most quarterback wins after two, three, four, five, and six seasons. So it's quite a cool record to have. Yeah. And I think only Ben Roethlisberger has more rookie wins than he had. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think, I think four and five, he, Past Matt Ryan as well. I think that was Matt Ryan who he beat. But defensively, though, it wasn't all good. Uh, zero sacks from the defensive line or pass rush unit. 470 yards given up 
which is a season high for this team against the Panthers team, which had won 10 straight. Cam Newton only uh, had five incompletions, went 25 for 30. Christian McCaffrey had 227 yards and two touchdowns. Carolina had the ball inside the Seahawks red zone seven times, fumbled the ball five times, which Seattle record zero of. But the defense for all that, as you said, they stepped up with one or two or three, if you include Dance Jones's uh, third down tackle and Christian McCaffrey early doors. Big plays, so as you said, the big plays came at the big moments. But apart from that, it was slightly worrying, wasn't it, on the defensive side? Yeah, I mean, you've got Trey Flowers' tackle, which is obviously the match-winning player of the yeah, game, really, yeah, yeah. Um, forcing him to kick that long field goal. Um, I think it's difficult to be too critical of the defense because they're obviously they are fairly bereft of talent. And I think if, if you watch yeah. that game, my takeaway from it is if we played the Saints, they could score 60 points against us because not only would they be able to get get from back to front as quickly as Carolina did, they're just much more clinical in the red zone. And I think we were yeah. pretty fortunate that I thought some of their play calling in the red zone was a bit ticky-tack. And also, as much as we absolutely lauded Cam Newton last week, rightly so, I think he's a great quarterback, he's never been nest when field, when he got any players inside 20 yards – versus inside 60 yards of field where, you know, it gets all a bit congested for him and he, he doesn't necessarily pick the right pass or at, at that stage and his accuracy lets him down a little bit in that situation. So, as I say, I think this was one of the few examples where bend but don't break defense is a, is a valid way to call it. Um, but ultimately, I think Brian Baldinger did, a, well, I know he did, he did a brilliant little thing on uh, his tape breakdown of the three plays that won the game and we won all three of those games, uh, those plays. It was... Um, the fourth down stop on Cam, it was the Naz Jones uh, tackle, and it was also Trey Flowers. And I just think in the biggest moments we managed to step up and force them off their off their perch a bit, and it, yeah, that was ultimately the difference between winning and losing. Yeah, I mean the Trey Flowers player, especially because he got worked on Sunday by uh, DJ Moore, the rookie first rounder for them. He had eight catches for 91 yards. He got worked underneath a few over the top. Uh, DJ Moore's in this for 20 hours, but he seemed to he seems to be the most coachable DB. I mean, we kind of obviously he's, he chased Shaquille Griffin, chased down Christian McCaffrey with just ridiculous speed. I think it's the fastest recorded player so far this mm-hmm. year or something I saw from Dugas Twitter earlier. But the, he just seems really coachable. I think uh, Pete Carroll raved about him on 710 on Monday morning, Monday as well. But the, the fact that he was able to trail DJ Moore and just it, it was kind of he kind of wanted to take the completion and just be there for the tackle was a pretty impressive open fit where DJ Moore would have iced the game to a certain extent, but definitely would have got uh, well ten or fifteen more yards than he did, and I think he only got four or five on that catch. It was a proper proper impressive play from a guy who was a fifth not only a fifth round draft pick but a safety for his entire collegiate career, and he's been one of the bright spots of the uh not just well not just the Seahawks defense but the 2018 season hasn't yeah, it yeah 100 percent. i mean that play he as you say he trails david moore about 30 yards across the field I mean, he played that like you expect sherman is primed to play it um you know off the right corner position and he tackles him kind of in the slot on the left hand side it was an amazing play and as you say he didn't overcommit trying to win the ball he was happy for the completion to happen and make the tackle like that was just great situational football and uh yeah. I mean, people are saying now he they think he might already be better than Shaq Griffin, which I think might be a little bit of a push. But he's uh, he's showing incredible, um, the incredible progress for a guy who's like six games into his actual career. <laughs> yeah, it's quite daft and also pretty exciting what the Seahawks could have going forward uh, on both sides of the of, of the secondary uh, on the outside, obviously opposite. Shaquille Griffin, obviously the guy in the middle though was there yet again, leading the team in tackles 11 tackles on Sunday, only player on the field who got more tackles than him, was the guy who's probably LB2 uh, in the NFL, Luke Keekley finished with 12 Bobby Wagner 11, and I think the play which especially Mike Dugard blew his mind was the one where he took on three two of three Carolina Panthers and managed to stop, I think it was Christian McCaffrey before he got to the first down, he was there again and also seem to be covering the tight ends a bit more on Sunday which was interesting he has been incredible this season I, I almost think that in playing in a slightly worse team with less people covering around him making great plays as well his ability has really come to the fore 
because he's kind of having to make plays and he's making plays that guys around him just aren't capable of doing. He stonewalls Cam Newton on that fourth and two. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, well, I I'll, think it probably well, was a generous this... spot for us and it probably was a first down. Yeah, but still, to stop yeah. Cam Newton in his tracks and basically not give him any push is a ridiculous sign of strength. Yeah, I, th- I think I think he gives up three inches and about fifteen pounds to Cam Newton as well. That's but that's just me pulling numbers out the air. I'm pretty certain that's the case. Yeah, he's just he's the best linebacker. He's the best player in the position. He's one of the best defensive players. And, and yet again, it's another year where he's compiling tackles and stats and numbers and film and just doesn't seem to be getting any national traction, which is just it's just a bit annoying really because he is definitely he's the best defensive player on this team. So. And it's yeah, we're we massively needing with issues elsewhere at the linebacker position this year. After the Sunday, though, the Seahawks now won 11 of their past 17 road games, which kick off in at 10 o'clock Pacific time. And it was a game where Tyler Lockett did not return a single kickoff. He almost seemed bored by the fact he had to stand back there and just watch the ball go over his head. And as the game, we talk about defensive plays, but the biggest one we've spent 30, uh, most of our lives, Adam, knowing that Scotsmen can't kick footballs. <laughs> they can't kick American footballs either, can they? No, we all knew it. I mean, if, if you'd said you were sending uh, Stephen Fletcher and Kenny Miller out to take a penalty, you'd dump yourself. You know, they're going to sky it high and wide. So uh, I don't know what you expect. Funny enough, you make a football comparison. You know when you've been to football games where you've been the better team, but you've just missed chance after chance after chance. And eventually you like, you look at your mate who gone with and you think, you know what's going to happen here. They're going to score. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel on the reverse. This game was for a Seahawk and Carolina fan. Cause they must've thought after the first quarter, like this is going to be a, a, you know, just an easy dance. Uh, you know, they're red zone off the red zone, off the red zone, miss chance, miss chance, miss chance. And I wonder how many of their mates would have turned to each other and just thought, it's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Because that's exactly how it felt to me on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, also the five fumbles, not, not one of them was recovered by the Seahawks. That's some weird fumble, fumble risky look, which is just seems to be the thing for the Seahawks, doesn't it, over the last few years? Uh, one other thing for the game on Sunday, like Tyler Lockett's touchdown, which was delayed by a challenge by Pete Carroll because Tyler Lockett was ruled down, but he obviously was in the end zone, was his celebration. But, like, I'm not a massive NBA fan, but I've always been so I'm interested and fascinated and enjoy the Allen Iverson story. That is a pretty cool celebration, wasn't it? Doing the Iverson over Tyron Lou step over. Yeah, and the people that do love their uh, basketball were going wild about that celebration. So yeah. obviously it was, yeah. uh, I don't know, a bit like doing a Shearer or maybe a Robbie Fowler little sniff, sniff up and down the line uh, in, in terms of its iconic nature. Maybe it was something like that, but uh, it did yeah. seem very cool. And watching, when you watch the two videos side to side, uh, it was giving, they've set their game up on the, on the celebrations this year. Um, yeah. oh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think, I, I think Will Blackman used to play for Seahawks while he won the Super Bowl with the Giants. He tweeted after uh, Eddie Jackson led the M- Motown choir on Thursday night on <laughs> Thanksgiving. He goes, he wants to get back playing because this looks like it's so much fun now, obviously, because <laughs> he played in a time when uh, celebrations were basically outlawed thanks to Chad Johnson and the rest of them. But yeah, it was really, really cool. And there's a pretty cool piece on the by Jason Jenks, who actually, I think he actually got a quote from uh, AI himself on, on, on Tyler Luckett's celebration. So it would be interesting. And Tyler Luckett said that that was the one he was supposed to do in LA, but instead handed the ball off to Floyd May with that, uh, Iverson bothered by Lou. Iverson, how about that? And the steps over to Ron Lou. Seven straight points. So, well, a few questions. I don't want to see well, but before we like go over them too much, it'd be best to get some of them now. Nick, Nick the Greek asks the biggest single factor for the difference between this season and last. Less injuries, better better airline play, no cable, better running back play, better lock, or better locker room atmosphere. Um, I think it's all of that combined, isn't it? Yeah, I think the offensive line has to. I don't think you can win without a good offensive line. I think it's kind of that no. that reductive now. And if you look at what's happening with Oakland's offensive line and what happened with yeah. our offensive line last year, they're being the common denominator. Yeah. I find it quite difficult. Well, to say anything but the fact that losing Tom Cable and replacing with Mike Solari has made an enormous difference. And I think in terms of general play, 
you're you're almost foolish to suggest that there's anything that could be more significant than that. Yeah, I, I think one thing is that we heard when the when uh, Cable and Daryl Bevel were fired and Chris Richard was was that firing? Which kind of just like yeah, thought they changed the locks and them kind of thing. It was a weird thing with Chris Richard, but um, I think they just I think Pete Carroll just got guys who were more on his message of Ken Norton. He's worked with pretty much the best part of a decade. In, at USC and obviously Seattle before he went down to Oakland. I think I mean, it's Mike Slary. He's got people in Shot and Iron especially. He's got people who are coaching underneath him who can pass the message along more consistently than maybe Cable was. And he's, I mean, Cable's coaching. It, well, not just what's going on in Oakland, but if you go and watch uh, the Colts play and run the ball, Mark Lewinsky is leveling players <laughs> since he's been in there for the last five, four or five weeks in, in, in Indianapolis. So it's not just these two parts where the Tom Cable thing. I just think he... He kind of took back control of the coaching side of it and got back on message, obviously, with some we're going to see this week and other, other moves they made in the offseason. I, I, I do think the O-line, but also I think you mentioned the last couple of weeks as well, Ken, Ken Norton has got that defence ready to play and they're playing a pretty high, a pretty uh, excitable level, if that's mm. right, because they just, they just seem to be enjoying every second of it, which didn't seem to be the case for certain people. And at certain points last year, and it, it, it kind of just seemed like you don't often see shots of uh, Ken Norton, and he looks like a deer in the headlights. You saw that quite a bit with Chris. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I don't like to do this, but the pedestrian podcast may have to get in the bin in the in the sense that we might have to eat a bit of crow here because we you know we thought it was going to be a negative season, and I don't think in our wildest dreams we could have expected to be in this favourable position yeah. going forward and we may not like exactly how it's all come together, but it's hard to argue with it, you know, unfortunately or otherwise. No, no. But I think, I think defensively, Pete Carroll's showing what a ridiculously good coach, especially with people like Trey Flowers, a ridiculously good coach he is at just coaching. He probably just coaches the basics and just does it to an ex- extremely high level. So I think his kind of, if you want to call it Hall of Fame credentials, has been solidified and certified somewhat by this year. But also, yeah, I think we kind of do have to kind of okay, fair play. But I don't, I think, I don't think anyone saw this coming. I don't think anyone saw a month ago the slate of games and with how the offense was looking, how the defense was looking, and the play. But with no KJ right. Obviously, everyone's left from the secondary. Pass which is basically Frank Clark or nothing. So I, I, if anyone says they saw this coming, then they're just either. We're always wearing pink rose tinted glasses, or they're just lying basically because no one saw us being at I think 76% is our playoff chances as we stand. I think if they beat the Vikings and win the three NFC West games, obviously two against the Niners and the Cardinals at home on week 17, the playoff chances are 99%. I mean, there's there's there can't, can't be anyone who saw this coming so quickly. We, we were saying a month ago that this is a team which looked like They'll be really good next year, but it looks like they're ready to uh, cause some cause some mischief in January this year, Adam, or next season. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? Funny, it's funny you should say that. Um, I think Sean Wilson asked us a question about do we have any lucky pants or superstitions and stuff like that, and I am as superstitious a person as it comes. Like, I'm wearing the same clothes for Spurs tonight that I wore for Chelsea on Saturday. <laughs> washed, washed that <laughs> I, 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 I did that um, for Cov uh, in May when they wouldn't not... I wore the same... Washed again. Wore the same shirt and jeans combination and hoodie combination for both playoff finals, semi-final legs and the final at Wembley. The only difference being that the playoff final was in like 35 degree heat and I was sweating. <laughs> So it doesn't always work out the best. Well, you won all three games, so it does work. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it was no more teasers on Saturday at Spurs. We didn't have time, so it's no more teasers tonight at Spurs, and that's why we won. You know, that, that's <laughs> that's the way it goes. But I I said to a couple of mates a couple of days ago that you know I think I might be looking to go to uh, to Dallas or Chicago for the playoffs, and they said, oh my goodness, you would never normally say that. You're so superstitious. But I kind of feel like we're playing with house money at the minute, and being in the position we're in. If we don't make the playoffs now, it'll be a disappointment. But it's not going to be a yeah. crushing disappointment like it was last year, where you were so flat at, after this, after the Arizona game. Like if we don't make it this year, you'll be buzzing for next year regardless. It, it, yeah, like if if whenever the season ends, if you hear Rus- if you hear that Russell Wilson said what he said in the in the tunnel at Atlanta in in his uh, rookie year, you can't go okay, yeah, that sounds right. I think I think we'd all agree with that, and it's not just pie in the sky thinking because this team as we said a month ago looks like especially if you think 
Trey Flowers, Shaquille Griffin, and everyone back there. They're going to replenish defensively, if not in the draft, and definitely in free agency with some pretty, you'd expect, banner names and marquee signings as well. So it's everything will be more encouraging than we possibly would have hoped so quickly. And it just, just is a massive testament to the people who are making decisions who kind of had an off-season where they got lambasted by everyone from all comers, including us two of them. Yeah, and there were certain things that they deserve to be lambasted for. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in in certain things they've done, you can't really argue. They've been they've been fantastic. Yeah, they have. And I think John Schneider deserves a hell of a lot of credit because he seems to have absolutely nailed it with the draft, and not just the draft. Obviously, Ed Dixon's come in and been a pretty solid con- contributor. And they got DJ Fluker on the offensive line has been massive. Bradley McDougall, the money they gave him in the off season seems like an absolute bargain. The way he's playing his south tip in interception Sunday was one of the plays we didn't really discuss, but it was a pretty cool play to see from a safety position. We didn't really see much of that from from the guy who replaced in number 31. He was more of a thumper, but Bradley McDougal seems to be more of a Swiss Army knife, as we said. In the past, uh, we're obviously raving about Russell Wilson. Is anyone else who deserves some praise, want to praise on Sunday? Adam? Um, well, it was really nice seeing Az Jones fly in and you know yeah. make you know, big contributions. Um, uh, only 13 snaps, though. Strange. That that whole thing is very strange. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll, probably, I'll probably go with it. I think Trey Flowers deserves just because sure. he, 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 he could have been, after what Devante Adams did to him a week before and after how the first, well, not maybe not the first quarter, the second and third quarter went, the middle of that part of that game went against DJ Moore. He kind of could have gone to his shell a bit, but he stepped up and didn't kind of have short-term memory. <clears throat> I made what turned out to be a pretty decisive play. Um, but back on questions, Mark Wilcott asked, what has most impressed you about the Seahawks play this season, considering we are in a rebuilding year? I just think it's the fact that they have been in every single game and seem to be defensively, especially apart from Sunday. I mean, Sunday's probably the biggest disappointment defensively, isn't it? Even with the two Rams games, because they're doing that to everyone. Yeah, I think to not even be close to being blown out in any game, and I think you know every loss has been one score. One score, yeah. I think after Sunday we've we've won the last five in Carolina to an aggregate score of about fifteen, I think, as well, which is ridiculous. Yeah, so I, I think to be in that situation is pretty incredible, given you know a lot of people said. Well, I think every, there wasn't an NFL expert in inverted commas that said we'd even make the playoffs. So. If no one thinks you're going to make the playoffs, that means that they think you're not that great and teams that are not that great get blown out by great teams. So to be in that yeah. situation, I think, is incredibly impressive. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Mark also asked, can the Seahawks really go 4-1 and to finish regular season? I'm assuming a tight win against the Vikings and lost to the Chiefs, even though both are in Seattle. Hopefully the three games shouldn't be an issue. Obviously, the game against the Vikings is the most important with tiebreakers. The... Uh, don't know why, but the game in San Francisco is worrying me more than the game against the Vikings. Yeah, I mean, are we going to need it? Um, Which? I, th- I, think, I think if we beat the Vikings and then, as I said, I think I think if we beat the Vikings but lose one of the NFC West games, I think it's 84% a playoff thing. So it's not, but it just would be a nice little cushion to have with Niners, Chiefs, Cardinals left after. Mm. I mean, the good, the good, yeah, the good thing about San Francisco is there's such an apathy around that team. You know, it doesn't sell out. It's not like, you know, you're almost in a neutral venue at worst with the way that the Seahawks fans travel at the best of times. So yeah. you'd have to hope that it's it'll probably be one of those scrappy kind of 17-12 type games that goes down the end and you think, oh, that wasn't a great performance, but you leave with a W and that's kind of all that matters. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, Sean asks, any game day rituals you can advise that will 100% work for a Seahawks win this weekend? I think as we've witnessed in the past, Adam, to get Mark Jackson on the tallest RV in the park. And that that always, apart from sometimes, works. <laughs> I think it's three, uh, no, two and one, I think I am in Seattle. Uh, Bills, Oakland, that sounds right. Panthers, Bills, Raiders, yeah, two and one. Yeah, I think I'm three and one in Seattle and then... I think I'm five and one in Seahawks game, so you know if someone's to pay for my flight, get me out there. Uh, that that seems a pretty good way. You you have to pay off my clients as well, who I'm going to be letting down for catering. But I'm sure we can make that work for a bit of sport. So don't worry about that. So yeah, get the Nathan out there, and we'll be flying. Yeah, uh, and Dave Bay wants to know what grades would give uh, Norton and Schottenheimer. I think Norton deserves higher 
thing because shot and ammo is still really annoying. Yeah, hundred percent. I would say A and B. Oh no, I can't give shot and ammo a B. B minus. So I was going to go. I was going to go B C minus. Do it because we did. We we did just give four hundred and seventy yards. It's the most Seahawks give up in a win since they beat the Texans just over a year ago. But uh, moving on, no, the Seahawks return back to CenturyLink Field this week for the first of basically where they're basically not going to have to leave their home comforts for the rest of the season as they face Carl Shanahan and whichever quarterback they're starting this week and the San Francisco 49ers. And obviously a very familiar face on the defensive side for the Niners. Yet the two and nine San Francisco 49ers roll into town on the back of a 2079 defeat in down in Florida at, against Tampa Bay. Um, but this team's season, this team's long term, whatever, kind of went out the window week three when Jimmy Garoppolo's knee exploded on the sideline at Arrowhead. It kind of you kind of put asterisks next this season if you're a if well if you're a 49ers from if you're an NFL observer. But this team, despite their record offensively in particular does things pretty well with with someone we've raved about in the past as one of the top uh, offensive play callers in the league Adam yeah it's been one of those years for the Niners that you know they would have gone into with so much hope probably thinking that they could probably be in the record position that the Seahawks are in going into this game Um, but it just shows the importance of a quarterback and uh, Garoppolo is a guy that we think can probably make the best of the talent around him. We don't know that for sure, but um, it was an enormous loss and it was going to be a lost season. The second he went down really, wasn't it? Yeah. And this is a team though, which on the running the ball, especially with mainly Matt Breeder is the number five rushing offense in the NFL. And Matt Breeder has a mast as the page fails. So those 738 yards on the ground with three touchdowns. He's been a bright spark and runs the ball pretty well, especially to the outside, which is going to be the probably the main focal point on Sunday for the Seahawks defense is, is stopping Matt Breda, especially after what Christian McCaffrey did last week. Yeah, I'm kind of always happy if a team's going to come in against Seattle and try and run round us around the side because I feel like our gap discipline and the speed we have at linebacker has always been so good at stopping that. Um that if someone was going to come to me and say, how would you like a team to play against you? I would probably say focus on trying to run around the outside of us because I don't think that's where you're going to get us. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, especially because Trey Flowers, we saw in uh, Arizona when he forced the ball on David Johnson, he isn't scared to line up and hit and tackle. Uh, up receiving for the 49ers, George Kittle is by far away, possibly the well, healthy best receiver but definitely uh, whichever quarterback plays CJ Bessard or Nick I think Boyd. Mullins has a start no, number one target George Kittle has 31 more catches than any other 49er on 28 more targets and he amazingly has nearly 500 more yards than any other 49ers receiver with 823 yards and three scores he is he is like the new He's like the new era of Gronkowski and Jimmy Graham and that kind of era as they kind of reach the tail end. He's the next prototype tight end, isn't he? He's one. He's in the top upper echelons of tight ends in the league. Yeah, I think he's definitely in the top five. Um, Gronkowski is probably his best is done, and he's he's still probably the best at what he does. But his his best is probably gone. Um, and I think yeah, you know, Kittle, Kelsey. And Ertz are probably on on the on the same level as each other. I would say at this stage. Yeah, Eifert's kind of not never been able to stay healthy. Um, Awful team as well. Really th- yeah, I can't really think of anybody else. I mean, you, you do kind of have, especially being from the same draft class. Obviously, four rounds earlier and Kit went. David and Joku starting to show some flashes with Baker Mayfield. They could be kind of like the next mm. next battle. So you got Antonio Gates still. Picking up odd yards and touchdowns. OJ Howard was on for a Pro Bowl season as well. If you didn't get hurt as well, 
Yeah, yeah. So it's it is a it's a pretty cool group, and it's also for those who give a damn a pretty cool group coming in uh, in next year's draft as well at tie in. So it could be an interesting position in what in fantasy football terms has been an absolute nightmare position uh, this year. Outside of uh, Marquis Goodwin is has a head injury. He sounds pretty questionable. Pierre Garçon obviously has some run-ins with a guy who now he shares a locker room with in the past when he's a Washington Redskins, but it is, it is, you look at the, the names, obviously Dante Pettis is someone we enjoyed watching for the Huskies, and was on a pretty d- decent year, if not blowing anything away, he's found the end zone a couple of times, but and he's shown some pretty, pretty cool route running abilities, but this team on Sunday needs to come in and run the ball to have any chance and then keep Nick Mullins clean, Adam. Yeah, if they can play it against Oakland, they'll, they'll be fine. It's funny you should say that about Pettis. Wide receiver is, maybe becoming the position now that needs the most time to or has has the fewest kind of first round rookie stars you know you expect so many coming out to to be so great but you know Corey davis um, there's gonna be loads of examples but it's funny how long it seems to take these wide receivers to uh to, to really start start going isn't it yeah it is it's I mean, we've said we said Gordon Tate's always the one you kind of go back to. We kind of saw it with Paul Richardson as well, more close to home. But yeah, there is no Antonio Brown took a couple of years to emerge. The only real rookie class which kind of exploded was probably Odell Beckham's class. That's what was Mike Evans in that group as well. I think he was. Wasn't he? Yeah, and I think Sammy Watkins was as well. Yeah, so that was kind of the only one which kind of in their rookie year in particular kind of exploded onto the scene. But, you know, like Obviously, we had Corey, someone like Corey Davis and John Ross last year kind of didn't. Corey Davis is showing glimpses, but the offense kind of seems a bit archaic to make the most of his abilities. Corey Coleman's kind of flamed out the league already. He's bouncing around the practice squad in New England and on the active roster wherever he is now. So, yeah, it is, it is a position to watch. But Dante Pettis seems to. He's a pretty high draft pick for why he was probably expected 18 months ago as well, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he, I think the best thing about him is his, his route running. And if you look yeah. at. The the best guys now, um, you know, it's funny that you know Corder Addison, who looked so good when he started out. Uh, someone interestingly said, you know, Belichick's worked out that you know he can't really run any routes, but he's great when you get the ball in his hands, which is why he's kind of playing as a running back at the minute. Um, it's all about that clean route running, and I think Pettis has that, so he's going to be one to look out for on on Sunday because I think him and Mullins, um, who presumably practice quite a lot because neither one have been first team getting first team reps um i presume those two will be quite good together yeah yeah i, th- I think someone's highlighted a few of his uh uh routes he ran against the buccaneers on sunday he just he, he, he looks like a poor man's still ball with again did his uh, basketball stuff again on sunday uh on the defensive side though before it is a pretty much talent void but there is as I keep saying, that familiar face in the form of number 25, Richard Sherman. The Richard Sherman, for those who may not know, you may have been living under rock for the last eight years, Richard Sherman played 99 games, started 99 games for the Seahawks, 32 interceptions, uh, two pick sixes, and probably gave the most, gave us the most orgasmic singular <laughs> moment in Seahawks franchise history, didn't it, with the tip. But despite all that, I mean, you had Bobby Wagner earlier today, Pete Carroll coming out and saying... He shouldn't be booed, and he most definitely shouldn't be, but people are idiots, Adam. Yeah, I think you know, sports banter for the sake of awful words um, will, will be sports banter for the sake of awful words. Um, Sherman, for me, is, after Marshawn Lynch, the second most influential Seahawk of all time. Um, yeah. He gave the defence the swagger that it needed in order to take the jump and be be the team they were, which which Lynch kind of gave the entire franchise, in my opinion. And, yeah, you know, if you want to boo in the second quarter, if he makes a play or if he starts having a go at the ref, you know, you you do you. But if I was there, he'd be getting uh, absolutely lauded from the rooftops for me because he's uh, an all-time team great. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He, he, here's all that mad bro stuff against Tom Brady. Russell's rookie year that kind of put this team on the map and he just did not let them move off that map the whole time he, was there. he should still be a Seahawk it wasn't his decision that he isn't a Seahawk it was a team decision when they cut him he didn't ask to be traded to the 49ers they just traded him and I think I think a lot of people point to the fact that he was a locker room counselor but if you listen to how it seems every single person in that locker room has spoke about him this week and has spoke about him since he left 
that's not the case at all. Bobby Wagner said he's, he's he, he hopes get, he hopes he, he himself gets interception Sunday so he can go and jaw Richard Sherman on the Forty Nine <laughs> on the Forty Nine side line. Also said that Richard Sherman has a chance of, of a pick. He's going to run on and break the pass up himself just so he doesn't get one. Adam, <laughs> it's just it's great. Yeah, they're all obviously so close to each other, and it's and Mina Kimes has come up with a great tweet. She said, Richard Sherman was behind the greatest moment in Seahawk football history and embodied the spirit and identity of the team for years. Anyone who boos him isn't a Seahawk fan. Now, maybe that's a tiny bit OTT, but the sentiment, in my opinion, is bang on. Uh, not, 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 maybe not a Seahawks fan, but you never liked Richard Sherman to begin with. Now you've got an excuse not to like him. I think that's yeah, the well thing put, that it well is. Put. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, I, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing him. I, he's still locking down the corner for a defence which is Talent bereft, pretty much on most spots on the defense defensive side of the ball. Akela Witherspoon is a guy who's starting opposite him, who I really like coming out of Colorado a couple of years ago, but hasn't really made the step up. And obviously, apart from that, you got the D line with Solomon Thomas, who's been pretty underwhelming so far. Then the two Oregon Ducks uh, defensive lineman, DeForest Buckner, and the other guy, Eric Armstead, who just seems to be a bit of a pain in the ass when we play them in the last couple of years. But they will be the main. Points and I mean Armstead and Buckner against uh, DJ Fuka is going to be probably the the go to battle to watch on Sunday, isn't it? On that side of the ball, uh, outside of obviously Richard Sherman and Doug Baldwin, which could be uh, I hope they're mic'd up on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, look, for, for once, it hasn't happened many times this year, but I think there is a clear talent gap between the Seahawks and their opponents in the Seahawks' favour. And it'll be cool if they can kind of treat the Niners like they treated the Raiders and just just do them in, you know, just 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 yeah, beat them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the Raiders game is a, is a pretty spot on game to compare this one to. You'd hope with home comforts uh, that it would be something which comes somewhat handily. Entering the game though, the Seahawks are eleventh in weighted DVOA, which is. Uh, Brings all things into consideration. 12th in scoring offense, 8th in scoring defense, have 75% playoff odds, and done that with a team which lost so many stars, so many starters over the offseason, and played so far what is the third hardest schedule in the NFL. So on Twi- Seahawks Twitter, who we refer to in the past, has said for a couple of weeks, to be fair to him, in his, uh, I don't know if it's wisdom, but it's in something, uh, that the Seahawks are going to run the table. Uh, do you think that's going to happen? No, I think they'll get absolutely housed by the Chiefs. Yeah, But at that, that stage, uh, I don't think it'll matter. I think we'll be in the playoffs already, so it'll kind of be a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, and Gordon asked on Twitter, who who do we think the Seahawks would face? Who are, who are, they, li- who are they likely to face? in the playoffs if that does come to fruition at the end of the year. Well, I think it, you can pretty much guarantee it's going to be either the, uh, the Bears or the Cowboys, to be honest, because the Saints and the Rams are definitely okay. going to be one and two in whatever order. That, that's a guarantee. So they're in a bye. So you're going to face the winners. So the, the winners of the NFC uh, East, East and North are going to be three and four. So that is yeah. almost certainly going to be the Bears. And the way it's looking – probably going to be the Cowboys as well. So at that stage, you're, you're looking at the Vikings, the Panthers and the Seahawks as the three other teams. So I think it's going to be Dallas because I have a feeling we, we might end up sneaking that fifth spot versus sixth. And I think the Cowboys yeah. will be fourth. So if you were going to book any uh, optimistically early flights, I would say uh, get, yourself, get yourself on on kayak or sky scan or whatever it's called <laughs> and have a look at Dallas as I may or may not have already done. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the we talked about the Vikings game. I think that might be. I think that's going to be a bigger game for them because I think well, that's, they'll be chasing shadows. The we, have, we are with the Rams. I think they'll be chasing the Bears' shadow by that point. Um, obviously, it's only ten days away. Um, but um, yeah, so I think that will be a bigger game for them because the Panthers have to play the uh, Saints twice. twice in the final three weeks of the season, which is not going to be fun unless. We, we that the hope we have for Kansas City where they rest their, their guys, but I, I, for one, I don't see Andy Reid doing that in week 16. If it was week 17, maybe it's a different matter because which is what he did last year with Mahomes and uh Alex Smith set out week 17. I don't see that happening for the entire game in week 16. That's something we can talk to when the game comes around, but yeah, I think I think that seems to be the likeliest one. Colt McCoy, bless his heart, tried his best and he had a few impressive plays, but he just that offense isn't doesn't have the talent. 
been Ross Paul Richardson lost James Crowder. Josh Doxon has been a bit of a disappointment. Jordan Reed can't stay uh, healthy. Vernon Davis is kind of in and out of games at his, at his time of his career as well. And the O line kind of has too many blow ups to be a team, but defense is going to keep them in games. So if they can get uh, Adrian Peterson back running again, you never know. But I do think the Cowboys are probably going to hold serve in the NFC East. But yeah, who knows? But I think, yeah, if you want to go anywhere, Dallas could be the place we're going to go. And then, oh boy, <laughs> I could be fun if we get the sixth seed in there the second week of the playoffs, if we manage to get through the first week, obviously. But another trip down to the Coliseum would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I don't normally like this stuff, but the Rams would not want to play the Seahawks again. No, most definitely. I think the two teams the Rams want no part of the rest of the season. Well, no, probably three teams. I don't think they want to face the Saints again. I don't think they want to face us again. And I don't think they want to go against the Chiefs again. Because the Chiefs are winning that Monday night uh, if if they don't have the Mahomes turnovers. I mean, it's the first Mahomes turnover ever in his career at college or, or in the NFL that resulted in that like a pick six or a fumble, fumble touchdown. They're, they're not going to make those same mistakes again. I think they're the three teams that they don't want to face. They're also the three teams that they're probably going to face <laughs> <laughs> at this point. So it could be fun. Uh, confidence over Sunday. Score prediction, confidence. Adam? I think Seahawks by 11. Well, yeah, I think by 16. I think I'll about 33. I'll go 27-16. Okay, uh, yeah, so obviously we'll come back next week. The, the Seahawks then play the Minnesota Vikings on Monday Night Football. I think that's right. I think it's Monday Night Football. I hope it's Monday Night Football. Uh, and then, obviously, back to play, go down to San Francisco to play the 49ers. Chiefs and the Cardinals back in Seattle as well in Week 17. But before that, it's this time for this week's game. It's uh, bid. First of all, this is an exciting time uh, for our organization. 2017 Browns joined the 2008 Lions as the only teams to go 0-16. Get in the bin. Give me Josh Freeman, who was the 17th pick in the first round, over Cam Newton, who was the number one overall pick. And the 2015 AP Most Valuable Player is Cam Newton. Get in the bin. Chip Kelly's an evolver, and he's a smart guy, and I think he's going to go to San Francisco and and Mike, and they're going to be a much more viable football franchise. That the 49ers are expected to clean house and dismiss head coach Chip Kelly. Get in the bin. Bin has plenty of people and plenty of potential. Uh, I think I'm going to go for one of my old favourites in the shit for Well, it could be a number of people in the media who have kind of been cozied up to by a former NFL head coach who's now a special assistant at a, a fl- flailing uh, NFL franchise. Uh, Colin Cowherd's going to be the main point of my eye who just cannot give up and admit that he was wrong about every aspect of Baker <laughs> decided to take Hugh Jackson's um, side in what was a pretty f- uh, a pretty refreshing take from Baker Mayfield who had no intention of hugging or shaking the hand of Hugh Jackson after the Browns beat down on Cincinnati Bengals on Sunday and a lot of that due to Baker Mayfield and David Njoku and uh, Nick Chubb and it was it it's just, come on, Colin Cowherd especially, but Mike Silver. The fact that an NFL coach was fired and then did a media tour for two or three weeks before getting rehired by his whole team in the team he's just been fired from his division. And then the same people he visited are now the ones supporting him and backing him up against a rookie quarterback who, as Baker Mayfield himself said today, he's not the cookie-cutter quarterback. He's himself and he's never going to change, which is, as I said, remarkably refreshing from some of the stuff we get from NFL quarterbacks, uh, starting quarterbacks especially. So, yeah, just Colin Coward and all the media types who have been coached up to by a terrible, possibly the worst ever NFL head coach. Get in the bin, chaps. Uh, Adam? I think that's a really good point, by the way, about the media tour, because that's probably the one thing that Hugh Jackson, if he hadn't done, you'd have a bit of sympathy for him. But the fact that the minute he got fired, he was straight on the media tour, first take, uh, undisputed with hyenas like Skip Bayless, you know, it, that that that's where you can have little sympathy for for Jackson. I think for me, fair enough, using the word Jackson, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and unfortunately <laughs> Jalen, with his kind of jawing at Josh Allen with the, your trash stuff, whatever. If anything, what it shows is how remarkable a job the Seahawks did for five years being such a strong defense because the Jaguars did it for one year, and even then they were they were good, but they still gave up a load of points when it really mattered. But 
they have absolutely fallen off a cliff. And if they retain Blake Bortles, Bortles or find a reason to do it, that's going to piss me off a lot because his time there is done. That they're in desperate need of a change. Um, and yeah, I just think they can they can get in the bin because they've gone on, gone about this whole season as if the 16 games they have to play are a waste of time. Just get us to January in the playoffs, but you soon realise that these bet the reason some of the best teams are the best teams is that they churn through October, November, December and just pick up win after yeah. win after win, and they're never yeah. too arrogant to get those wins. And I feel the Jaguars yeah. all season, as soon as they beat the Patriots, the focus wasn't on week three or week four. It was on week 18 in the playoffs. And that, that, that I think, yeah. deserves bin status. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. Uh, also, for me, getting the bin, uh, I think, the, the, well, it sounds like Bruce Allen, the Washington Redskins, uh, a week ago, uh, Colin Kaepernick was too much of a distraction to even bring him for a visit, which is clearly a quarterback needy uh, franchise uh, after Alex was horrible. Uh, injury a few weeks ago, but then seems fit to sign Ruben Foster and haul his baggage. And also after a couple of weeks where they did nothing and said nothing and defended, Agent Peterson who admitted he still uh, hits his kid. So all they need now is to sign a, a deal to play a game in Saudi Arabia and they've got the full house, haven't they? Yeah, it, What's the it's pretty shameful. Um, you know, we try not to key down on the some of the more serious stuff too, too much because it's supposed to be an enjoyable listen, but um <laughs> Yeah, the, the 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 lack of well, sorry, the the level of hypocrisy in the NFL. Firstly, to good players versus bad players, uh, and yeah. also to what is objectively a bad thing to do versus someone's freedom of speech, which is apparently the First Amendment of the nation's you know, constitution. Um, yeah, it, it it doesn't do it for me. I have to say, I I find it very uneasy, uh, and I think that the Redskins to sign Reuben Foster to stash him basically on the off chance he might be available to play given the fact that very few teams you would imagine are sat there waiting to jump at the chance to take him I think it's an absolutely terrible look for the Redskins who should be ashamed of themselves yeah and also the fact that the team released a statement where they uh, said they got uh, references from Alabama players on the team and all bar one who one bit being Sean Dion Hamilton no commented said that they didn't get any uh, conversations from the team on Ruben Foster, so it's all a bit of a yeah a nause, nauseating situation in the nation's capital, uh, on, even in sport and not just other things. Um, For the all-time bin, that, by the way, it is worth pointing out yeah. that if the Cincinnati Bengals fire Marvin Lewis and hire <laughs> Hugh Jackson, I told you, I told that you. is I, bin of fame level. <laughs> I called it. I, 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 yeah, as soon as I saw that, I was like. Well, struck that one for me because I called that. That is the most obvious thing that's ever, ever existed. Also, one thing, more thing on that game, the opposite of getting a bin. Demorius Randall should get his gold jacket now <laughs> after he intercepted Andy Dalton and ran over to the sideline and handed the ball to Hugh Jackson. It's just the best. That's the best troll ever. So well done, Demorius Randall. Um, yeah. Uh, also, before we get on to locks and shock and other NFL stuff, uh, one more for in the bin. The, co- the college football playoff committee, who have Washington State at just two losses, one against just the ridiculously good and efficient defense uh, last Friday night uh, against the Huskies, um, are bit below three teams who have three losses and need a minor miracle to have a New York Six Bowl, which after the season that Gardner Minshew, as we spoke to Jess last week, said, a season for the ages, really, for the Washington State Cougars. The fact that they're not going to have the the platform on the stage of a New York Six Bowl game, they could, I mean, the fact that they're not going to be going to, uh, probably not going, going down to Arizona and playing in the Fiesta Bowl is just an absolute joke because they have to get the Michigans and the LSUs and all the rest of it are just in that top 10, just because they're East Coast and their games are more watched by the people making decisions. The fact that it's the fact that the Cougars play at three o'clock or late 10 o'clock on the Eastern East Coast time is you just, it's not hard to watch Cougar games after the fact. Just go and watch that team this year. The fact that they're below, uh, especially Michigan, who got absolutely hosed, on uh, Sunday and uh, LSU also had three losses and lost an absolute barn burner on uh, Saturday night. It's just an absolute nonsense. So they, they need to they need to change the quality of football playoff anyway, but they need to 
level the playing field somewhat because it is definitely slanted to the SEC, Alabama, and further east than that, isn't it? Adam? It's a nonsense. Um, I think Brock Heward said that for there to be eight SEC teams in the top 25 is just really is a suggestion that these games are on TV a lot more. The stadiums are a lot more full than maybe any other division, so that there seems like a passion there, which is is a point worth making that, you know, some of the Pac-12 attendances have been pretty pathetic this year, but it's very silly that there's such an obvious East Coast bias and the Pac-12 and the Pac-12 themselves do nothing to help themselves out with their bowl game being at 5.20 on Friday evening in Santa Clara, where there's going to be no one there. Yeah, no, and I think it might have been Brock Hughes as well, they posted that the, the of all the conference bowl games in the FBS, uh, the cheapest tickets on StubHub and secondary markets is the Pac-12 one, which you can get a ticket for for $27. 18 is, now you can get in the building. It's 18, that's just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's an impossible place to get to at 5 o'clock on a Friday evening. It's an impossible place to get to at 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, let alone in France. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just it's, it's a farce of a conference, but they also at the same time deserve a bit more leeway, especially with the story and how the, the Cougars played for all bar one game, really, wasn't it? And that was just past. I mean, they, even the loss they had before the Huskies was all down to just absolute nonsense officiating by Pac-12 refs. Yeah, that was against, against USC. So yeah, so the fact that they're not going down to Arizona is yeah, is absolute sham. Um, obviously, talking the Huskies. Oof, that was quite impressive defensively, wasn't it? And obviously, Miles Gaskin went out in the best way possible. And it's just, uh, it's weird how much more fun watching run plays break out 50 yards it is when he's running through the snow isn't it? it's a weird weird thing snow's always great to watch sport uh, there's <laughs> any, any kind of watching games at a stupid time of night or you know with ridiculous weather is always great fun um and yeah i mean that was a heck of a win i think the snow did play a part not 13 points or 14 points difference but um it, it, it certainly didn't help, um, and it gave Washington just that maybe a little bit of advantage that, that they needed to uh, to get the job done. But they uh, they should be proud of themselves because it was a hell of an effort. Yeah, it really was. And, uh, obviously, they now play Utah at Santa Clara on Friday for the right to represent the Pac-12 and probably the Rose Bowl, and you'd expect against Ohio State, which could be fun to end up Urban Myers, but possibly could be his collegiate career if Rich Eisen people Bruce Farben seemed to be hinting at last week about his concerns over his health. Uh lock and shot, add on quickly. Lock and uh, shot. Start. I've even, I've I've even got the, the schedule up in front of me. Who would have thought? I mean I I think the lock of the week I mean there is one but I don't want to do that to them. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the Chiefs at the Raiders. That seems very fair. Um and I think also the Ooh, maybe not. I think the Packers owns the Cardinals is a lock, in fairness. Yeah. Uh, shock of the week, Adam? Um, it's difficult to find like out-and-out out shocks these days, but I do feel like if you thought at the start of the season the Colts would go into Jacksonville and beat the Jaguars, that would be seen as yeah, a huge yeah. shock. Probably the same as the Bears going into New York and beating the Giants, that would be seen as a big shock. Um, but I think overall, if I had to do like an actual what may happen that could be fairly shocking. I think the Chargers going to Pittsburgh and winning is not beyond the runs of possibility. No. But what's, I mean, Marvin Gordon status is probably a big part of That's that. That's true. And this is a huge game for the Patriots as well, uh, home to the Vikings. I mean, it's out of conference. It doesn't matter in terms of the standings or whatever. But I think people, for, for the first time ever, there are legitimate concerns about the Patriots. I think Brady looks like he could be actually slowing up. And it'll be very interesting to see how he does against a defence like Minnesota, who... Uh, for all, although they've not been as good as we may have thought this year, they have still have legitimate talent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, saying about Brady seems to be slowing up. His throw to Gronkowski is amazing. It's, it's it's perfect. It's, oh, it's, yeah, it's the fact that he can still look, do that at his age is quite. But yeah, there doesn't seem to be that aura around this Patriots team. And to be fair, there probably wasn't before. But as the, someone put on Twitter last year, the Patriots only played two games every season, the AFC title game in the Super Bowl. So maybe that's when they'll turn it on. Uh, my shock of the week, I'm just changing the pick on our pick on because I've just realised I've got it the other way around. I think the Bills are going to beat the Dolphins. Ooh, that'd be a great shout. Yeah, because I think Josh Allen just seems to be someone who's <laughs> the NFL hasn't really, the, the kind of constantly surprised with the fact that I think he got 98 wrist yards on Sunday. As they beat the Jets, they beat the Jets. Uh, the Bills beat the Jaguars. 
Uh, I thought it was a jet. Do you know who beat it? Oh, the Patriots. Yeah, so I do. Okay, that's why, that's why I had the Jets in my brain. Um, yeah, I do think the Jets. I'm slowly stepping off on, onto the curb off the Dolphins bandwagon, I think. Um, the way they give that game up against the Colts, which is just. That is one team. I'll, if I'm an AFC team, I do want, not want them in the playoffs. If I do not want to face the Colts in the playoffs, because that offense is playing at a pretty high level. And Quinton and Nelson, Mark Gowinski are the new. I don't know, uh, Zach Martin and Leo Collins or whoever it was in Dallas a few years ago, they are monstering over people. It's pretty fun to watch. Uh, so, yeah, I think that would be everything. Uh, anything else, other NFL stuff, Adam? I think we're good. Um, been been a good season this year, hasn't it? It's been a better season than the last couple, certainly last year, which was a bit flat. There's been a lot of good stuff going on this year. Um, it's my cleat, my cause this week, so there should be some interesting stuff going on on players' feet uh, in the pre-game yeah. warm-up, so I look forward to seeing some of that. Yeah, and also one thing on that, uh, a big bit of a shout out, I'm not going to hear this, but Denver Broncos wide receiver River Craycraft. He might listen. Who used to play, used to, used to play, play collegiately for the Washington State Cougars, and obviously knew Tyler Helinski uh, pretty well, I'd imagine, and he's going to be adorning the Helinski hope and uh, his cleat for cause. His cause for cleats, whichever way around it is, <laughs> is for the Helinski Hope Foundation, which is pretty cool after all the work we've done. So it'll be pretty cool to see that on Sunday evening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can at your usual places, possessionpodcast.podbean.com, the Possession Podcast on Facebook, at Seahawkers UK on Twitter, UK Seattle Seahawks fans on Facebook, UK Seahawkers on Instagram as well. All the personal stuff you should know by now if you're listening, because this is our 80th episode we've somehow managed to ruse people into thinking we're somewhat semi-capable and got to 80 adults which is pretty that's cool. about 100 hours of your time we've wasted dear listeners how must you feel yeah, yeah. keep listening please keep listening and tell your friends 80 sleepless nights while trying to figure out why <laughs> to be fair we probably have, we probably hit 100 with all the failed recordings we've had oh, maybe 180 time. yeah and just one more note i've just found scribbled down somewhere i actually did take notes for this one and that's how bored i've been today um david moore and chris carson were seventh round picks in 2017 apart from elijah Maguire, who has a pretty impressive amount of yards uh no other player in the sixth or seventh round has that as many yards as moore and chris carson do and only george kittle and aaron jones who were fifth round picks in 2017 have more yards but um, only Aaron Jones has more touchdowns than them. Over his career, David Moore has touched the ball 22 times for 413 yards and five touchdowns. Carson is 210 touches, 990 yards and five touchdowns. Kittle has 99 touches for 1,338 uh, yards and five touchdowns. But Aaron Jones, which just kind of makes whatever's happening in Green Bay seem a bit strange, has 210 touches, 1,238 yards and 11 touchdowns. So it's it's it, we we talked about I mentioned John Schneider there's a lot of credit if you start at the start of the seventh round in 2017 and go from there, it's not looking like a bad crop of players he's brought in and infused into this team, is it? Not yet, uh, and yeah, not at all. And uh, long may that continue because we're gonna we've not got many picks next year, and so if we trade out of the ones that we do have, we're gonna need to uh, find some late gems again. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So uh, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy wherever you watch the game. Enjoy Sean and Mark and obviously everyone else who's making a trip out to, to Seattle to watch this game uh, at Central Link Field. I can think I'll speak for them. We are very, very jealous that you are doing that this weekend and you haven't managed to find the money in that back of the server to pay for us to come with you. <laughs> uh, but it, whether you watch the game from whatever corner of the world you watch the game, whatever corner of the world you watch, Alabama beat another team by 20 or more points. This is the Vamos Hawks. This is something that we've been working on. So the fact that it came out and I had a chance to do it, it was great. That was an exquisite job of holding space and everything by David to make his play. It's a great throw. Um, the execution was just gorgeous.